if you have a brain, you have bias. Featuring unconscious bias, thought leader and expert Matthew Cahill. Mm -hmm. Matthew has built a consulting and coaching practice based on the belief that if you have a brain, you've got bias. He excels at meeting people where they are on this lifelong journey of self-reflective discovery and moves organizations from bias to belonging. That's his tagline. Uh, his work allows leaders, well, no, if you have a brain, you have bias is his tagline. This is one of his, another of his trademarks. Um, Matthew's work allows leaders to fulfill their strategic goals and increase sales and employ productivity through promoting inclusion and diversity. He's partnered with a diverse portfolio of companies, including Oracle, HP, E-Trade, LinkedIn, Nielsen, et cetera, et cetera, and a select list of Silicon Valley startups. Now, everybody, please give me a warm NorCal chapter welcome to Matthew Cahill. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Roberta. And, uh, and be before I launch into formal programming, I got to just get the, I need to share what happened in these breakout rooms. Uh, and what Susan has just posted in the chat. So Susan Schwartz and I um, are part of an executive committee for a weekly gather gathering called Inclusive Leadership in a Virtual World. It's a gratuitous plug. Register once, come once, and uh, whenever your schedule permits. Um, we really dance this line and feature world-class facilitators each week in this virtual space. So you're guaranteed to learn something about inclusive leadership and probably a tip or trick or two that you can use to make this gathering, these types of gatherings more meaningful and resonant. Um, and the breakout rooms, like, like inserting breakout rooms is beautiful, Roberta. I love that as part of this meeting because you do get an opportunity. And my two breakout sessions can be summed up, love and war. First time, Dr. Maynard's all talking about love. Second round, John Tracy sharing the art of war. What, what, what a breath for this group right? Like that was just beautiful. It was wonderful, 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 wonderful. So thank you both for, uh, for sharing and the other folks in the, uh, in the breakout room as well. Uh, what I'm going to do is what I affectionately refer to as hijacking your screens. So I'm going to share some slides with you now. And always know in Zoom, you have the ability to take control of your space. So uh, on the right-hand side, if you're set up in gallery view, you can slide that, there's a little slider. You can move it over if you wanna make the screen smaller and see more faces. You can determine how you wanna experience this content. And, uh, and I'm gonna take you through about 30 minutes of, of, of interactive content. So um, let me ask, just with a very informal poll, you don't need to acknowledge it, but when Roberta sent out the invitation or whoever sent out the invitation, there was an assessment that was included in the text description. Uh, if you did take that assessment, uh, it's very simple. It's, it's, it's painless, really. It doesn't hurt. Uh, it takes about four to six minutes, and it gives you insight into this framework that I think is really useful. I'm building my practice on it, actually. Uh, so I'm, I'm giving you a, a reference here if you want to go take it. It's a resource that you can use. Uh, you can scan, get your phone out and scan the barcode if that's easier. Uh, it's very mobile friendly and laptop friendly. But it gives you an introduction into this world of bias that I walk my clients through. Um, and before I go any further, I want to make sure I share an additional uh, resource with you. So a couple resources have been shared already. The assessment is one. Um, because it is February 1st, this is a, uh, the theme for Black History Month this year is health and wellness. This resource that I just put into the chat is from the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. I love this resource. I love this resource because it shines such a bright light on the contributions of, of black folks from, uh, from 1920 on and even before. It, it really does, it's very, very heavy in positivity bias. The positivity bias is something that we're going to unpack a little bit further, but it, I think whenever conversations are centered around race, there's unconscious processes that often hijack the conversation. And those unconscious processes are what we're going to uh, shine a little more light on in this session today. So um, as we proceed, I wanna take, uh, I wanna share with you 
this work for me is both personal and professional. Uh, Roberta did a very nice job in giving you my professional uh, branding statements, my trademarks, uh, some that we shared a little bit earlier, some of the clients. This is, this is a, a gratuitous family photo. And I share this to indicate a couple things. The world that we live in is, is it really never has been, but it's not binary anymore. It's not just black or white. It's not just this or that. It's not just gay or straight. It's not just uh, any one thing. The world we live in is very, very, very nuanced. And more and more and more and more people are demanding to be heard. That's just a general trend in both the workplace and outside. This photo, while it is a gratuitous family photo, there's a lot going on with it. My wife, in appearance, is as black as I am white but yet she identifies as Latina. Uh, she originates from Bolivia in South America. Her first language is Spanish. She's much more comfortable uh, doing a salsa, merengue, um, uh, saya is the, is like, is the Afro-Bolivian music and dance that, that originates in her community. She is, uh, in some cases, in, in, in very, very, American business context deceiving because people will see her and see her a certain way and then put that into that unconscious category in their mind. And it's often a surprise when she starts speaking Spanish or she starts doing that uh, or, or, or kind of disrupting what that established category is inside of a person's mind. My children are ABCs. ABCs, uh, if you were born in America and you are of Chinese uh, descent, maybe you think of ABC as American born Chinese. Uh, that has a whole lot of other connotations that come along to it for that community. My children are Afro-Bolivian Caucasians. So they have their own unique identity that they navigate through the world. And, uh, and they are so much better at navigating that nuance. The next generation, uh, the upcoming generation is so much better at navigating the nuance of identity than what older generations are. And that's just anecdotal. That's a, that's a sweeping generalization, but that's been my uh, experience in, uh, in, in gathering some very cursory research around it. Uh, the final stereotype that I'm on a mission to disrupt in my work and in my life is a stereotype around pit bulls. That beautiful puppy right there is a uh, pit mix. And uh, pit bulls have such a bad rap because of how they've been stereotyped. There's even some insurance companies that won't even give you insurance in your homeowner insurance if you have a pit bull in the house. They are loving, wonderful, magnificent dogs. And, uh, and so that's another stereotype that I'm looking to uh, disrupt in the universe. How I want to start this presentation, rewind it a little bit, is asking you in the chat, Okay, go ahead and locate the chat on the Zoom window. If you guys are looking at my screen, you can see that up at the top. You can click on the chat button and just type in, what is your working definition of bias? What is bias? Go ahead and put that <laughs> dog owner bias. Thank you, Mary Beth, that's, that's wonderful. Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead and put in, what, uh, what is your working definition of bias? Roberta says, what I believe to be true. Thank you, Roberta, very, very good. Susan is talking about preferences. Yes, bias is often synonymous with preferences. What other types of bias? What do you think of when you hear the word bias? It's become one of those slippery terms that's uh, overused in many cases and is very contextual, right? Bias means something depending on the context. Judging others in many ways. Thank you, Charles. Yes, yes, yes. We got 20 some people. Come on, give me some more, give me some more. Jerome is saying a mental process that make quick links or connections. Yes, 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 yes. Now we're starting to add on the layers of definition and understanding for bias. Yes, the amalgamation of experiences. Beautiful, Patricia. Yes, the, the total sum, the, the accumulation of your life experience shapes a lens, forms a lens that you then see the world through and you see new experiences through. Very, very good. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, John. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Gerald is throwing in the judge. Yes, judging others by your own personal beliefs. Oh my gosh, this is really, really good. This is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. 
So I wanna make sure you're, you're taking away one of the key points, which is differentiating between types of bias. Most of what I read in the chat are, are variations, are nuances related to cognitive biases, right? And that may have been primed very intentionally when this, the title was given, if you have a brain, you have bias, right? I started using a form of cognitive bias, of unconscious bias, to start to shape this conversation. Right? how we were going to, sh to have this presentation, what I was going to focus on started in the email that Roberta had sent. Now, bias, as it turns out, is a very useful linguistic construct because it can be used to unpack very, very deep institutionalized systemic biases around gender, right? It can be used to open up very, very deep systemic biases, conversations around race. It can be used to highlight cultural biases. It can be used to talk about bias related to age. So bias, right, is a very useful construct. Where it goes off the rails a bit is because it's not, it, it's often used in and understood in different contexts, different than what the person is intending it. These four types of bias, there's also biases related to abilities, biases related to identities through orientation. Those collectively I call social biases. And those collectively, those social biases are best measured by behaviors, not necessarily thoughts. Okay, so I wanna unpack that a little bit more and go back to our thoughts. Our thoughts, can be broken up into uh, two different realms, conscious and unconscious. And bias resides in both. Conscious biases, I think, are very relatively easy to, to identify, right? So, so if you're seeing somebody, you see an intentional act, uh, it's usually stemming from uh, a, a, a feeling or an unjust belief of superiority or inferiority over another person, place, or thing. Unconscious bias is a little trickier because it's outside, by definition, it's outside of your conscious awareness. So to shed a little more light on that, I like to use an information processing model of understanding how the brain works. This is way oversimplified. Our brain is far more complex than what I'm putting out there. But this mental model is useful for understanding what's going on under the hood, okay? Under the hood of our own consciousness. So in our brains, we're processing about 11 million bits of information every moment of every day unconsciously, right? This is a great contributor towards why we need a certain amount of sleep every day. It's not only for our body, but equally so, it's for our minds, right? We have to let our minds shut down to process the volume of information that our brains are taking in every moment of every day. And outside of this 11 million bits, or in addition to this 11 million bits, our conscious mind is actually capable of bringing in about 50 bits of information. Now, if we're unaware of this 11 million bits and we're only focused on the 50 bits, we often get limited by our own mental constructs, right? We forget that there's so much more that's really driving and dictating what that 50 bits is even capable of. And one of the leading thought, one of the thought leaders in this area, a man named Daniel Kahneman, uh, uh, he partnered, his, his partner early on uh, was probably really like, even Kahneman will admit that like, the, the, the genius behind their work together. But Kahneman outlived him. He got the Nobel Prize. And Kahneman is brilliant in his own right, right? They were very, very diverse in their thinking. And they paired well together and produced amazing work. A seminal work in this series of research and books that they did is called Thinking Fast and Slow. And what this does, while it creates a binary construct, 
it gives some useful characteristics. So that 11 million bit area that I mentioned before, system one, all of the mental processing that's happening there is fast, it's unconscious, it's automatic, it's how we make most of our decisions every day. System two, right, is much more of what we see and understand as our conscious reality, right? And it remembers 50 bits is, is the average, right? Maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, but it's very, very limited in relation to this unconscious area of, of mental processing, right? This 50 bit, while small in number, is very powerful, right? Think about how you feel after you've spent hours focused on a brief or a paper or research or writing a book or, or, or intentionally focused time and effort. It's very draining, right? But this is this, so this type of mental processing requires a lot more energy. And therefore, it, uh, it, it and we often lose sight of, of the greater amount of unconscious mental processing that's serving to shape that 50 bit. One of the nuanced definitions when we were going through the, the chat exercise was how bias is really baked into the way that unconscious mind is processing information, right? It's the way our conscious and unconscious work together to do the magnificent work that they do, which is allow us to all be here right now and for everyone to communicate and understand with each other. For uh, Roberta to add in as Amos Tversky. Yes, that was the name that was escaping me earlier. Thank you, Roberta. It is a, uh, it is a, the way our brains work, we have bias baked into those neural processes, right? We would not be able to process the volume of information if we had to try to consciously think through every single act and command, right? Think about brushing your teeth this morning. Your conscious mind, that 50-bit area of system two mental processing didn't issue a singular command for each step. Left hand, grab the toothpaste right hand, grab the brush. It just doesn't work that way. It's the default programming that is guides that 99.999% of our actions all throughout the day. Driving a car, right? Most of us that have been driving for any length of time, it's not necessarily a conscious process, right? It's a, a default behavior. When you start to think about all of the things that are happening under the hood, outside of our conscious awareness, it really helps shed some more light about what is happening in that 11 million bit area, right? It's all, our, our, our brain is also controlling our bodily functions, our heartbeat, our, uh, the chemicals that are being released into our body at any given point in any given time, all of the myriad of emotions that we may be experiencing that may not be directly uh, infused into that conscious 50-bit area of system two processing. So the key takeaway here is if you have a brain, you have bias. And a conversation about bias is not to be feared, right? A conversation about bias gives you insight into what's happening in your own mind and in your own created universe of relationships, people, places, and things. This area is fascinating. In the last five to 10 years, there's been advances in neuroscience, in evolutionary psychology, in biology, in, in social psychology. Lots of research is now starting to scratch the surface of how our brains are processing information. And rather than go into the well over 180 different types of cognitive bias, I've built uh, a practice around five that I think are the most common in any given workplace, in any given day, all day long. These five give you insights into your thinking that will make you as a leader better, better at making decisions, better at picking relationships and nurturing relationships and strengthening relationships and a better disruptor of bias that's been baked into our societal structures, institutionalized in our world. So these five, I'm gonna go over them very, very quickly. This is not gonna do justice to any one of them. We could spend all day on any one of them, but the, the, the five form an acronym 
Another way that's useful for our brains to process information, right? The use of acronyms. But like me bias, this natural tendency to gravitate towards similar people. Uh, we're we're going to unpack that one a little bit more. So let me briefly go through egocentric availability, anchoring, and proximity. Egocentric bias. What you need to know about that at this point is very, 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 very common in doctors, lawyers, uh, PhDs, research scientists, people that have shown a high degree of success in any one area or domain are very, very highly susceptible to the negative side of egocentric bias, right? Over time, they forget that not everybody has that level of experience and expertise. Over time, they forget that even though they have a tremendous amount, could be 30 years of experience, it still only represents one lived experience, right? It pales in comparison to the volumes of information that are still out there that haven't been processed, even by that person that studied it their whole life, right? So, so the, the error becomes in when you start to believe that what you say or believe is it and expect everybody else to just also know it to that same level of depth. Availability bias is, uh, contributes towards egocentric bias, but this has to do, it's a direct correlation to the amount of volume that we process, that the information that we process, we're dependent on quick retrieval of information to be able to process and move on, right? Most of the time, this bias is really, really helpful, really helpful until it's not. Right when it starts to bleed over into oh I don't know confirmation bias right or a halo effect where you're attributing things to uh, to to people places and things where they don't really belong right and it's due to the easiest access ac accessible information anchoring bias is intentionally used in sales in marketing the entire retail industry is built on anchoring bias. It's the fuel behind the power of a first impression, right? And that's when our brains, they get anchored on the first data point, graph, or image, and then the rest of the conversation is built off of that. And then finally, proximity bias. This bias has taken on all new uh, folds inside of the pandemic and continues to shape our thinking because we have a, a natural inclination to favor that which is closest to us in time and space. And when we're living and working and, and communicating in this virtual universe, it really does impact how we go about doing this, how we create connections with other people, how we communicate with other people. Proximity bias, again, we could spend a whole day on that. Uh, but those are the five that are the most common in every workplace. So what I wanna share with you now is um, if you did take that uh, exam, if you did take that five common bias assessment that I shared with you at the beginning of this presentation that Roberta had put in the email, the key takeaway in doing that and being introduced to these five common cognitive biases is to destigmatize bias. And I'm, I mentioned at the beginning, bias is often associated with a lot of negativity. Right? There's a negativity bias that's baked into bias. But it's not uncommon to hear that you may have a bias in favor of chocolate instead of ice cream, right? Of, of motorcycles instead of cars, a bias for travel, a bias for something, a bias. So this is what makes bias a useful construct because it's, it's provocative and yet it doesn't necessarily serve to shut people down. It, when you get into conversations about uh, diversity, about harassment, about prejudice, about discrimination, that language has legal implications. And there are conversations that must include that. But conversations around bias don't necessarily have to shut down a person's uh, um, ability to explore and be curious. And most of all, the conversations about bias and the scores and the assessment, they don't indicate that you're a bad person, 
right? Th this, the way I design this and focusing on like me, egocentric availability, anchoring and proximity, these are byproducts of the way all human brains process information. So learning more about them gives you a good foothold and, and can open up conversations and at minimum open up a self-reflective process where you'll learn things about yourself to make you a better human being. Because we're all swimming through a bias ecosystem. And bias in this context, as I've explained thus far, bias begins in our thoughts. Bias is born out of our mental processing, about our lifelong accumulation of associations, how we see the world, uh, how we've experienced the world, things that have happened to us and around us. Bias begins in our thoughts, and it's a necessary part of just being able to function, right? Just being able to think. Bias morphs itself in this ecosystem, in this conceptual model, through our behaviors. And if you have conscious bias, if you have biases that are, are embedded into implicit bias within behaviors related to gender, race, culture, age, orientation, the best measurement of the impact of that bias is the behaviors, right? The best measure of, of that type of bias, of social bias is behaviors, not necessarily thoughts, because we all think messed up things from time to time. So the behaviors, right, are really where the, the measurements can begin and measured over time. This is where the time is a crucial element in the bio, bias ecosystem. Because without factoring in time, we can never get to how bias becomes baked into our institutions. And therefore, without factoring in time, we can never get it out of our systems, right? We can never really attack systemic racism until we really factor in the historical context within which it got embedded into our institutions in the first place. So the bias ecosystems gives us starting points for deeper, more constructive conversations around bias. Now, I wanna, I wanna, deep, I wanna dig into, I'm gonna take the next two minutes, because I wanna dig into one of the five common cognitive biases. This one is usually the easiest for folks to get their minds wrapped around because it has everything to do with you. Like me bias is uh, this unconscious mental process. It's driven from uh, our, our, our need to connect with people. It's driven by a comfort that you feel when you uh, meet somebody who went to the same university that you did. It could be uh, a shared experience like that, uh, but it comes from this automatic processing that our brain is doing all the time, putting people in an in-group or an out-group. And sometimes it's as subtle as you just don't like that person for some reason. And your conscious brain doesn't really take the time or has the ability to, to figure out why they're just in that out-group because your unconscious mind has saw them as some type of threat. So like me bias is very pernicious. It's very prevalent. It's very, very pervasive in hiring and promotion processes. So in the workplace, like me bias contributes to these segregated systems, right? Homogenous workforces when it's not disrupted and it happens over time. Now there's some that believe that like me bias, uh, you know, it's actually a very, a strength when a company is small and they're nimble and they don't have time and a homogenous grouping of like three to five people can get a lot done. That may be true until it's not, right? Once you get into the complexity of larger, even small and mid-sized companies and larger organizations, it's proven over and over and over again that over time, diversity is really a strength. And those companies outperform, diverse companies outperform homogenous companies over time, right? So, so how do we mitigate against this natural tendency our brain has to other people, right? Like, like if somebody gets into that out group, what can we do to get them out of that out group? It's a real great question for consultants to ask when it's happening to you or you see it happening in, in your client's work. 
So I'm going to start to tee up a, uh, a breakout room conversation by asking you to go back to the chat. Okay. And I want you to go back to the chat and I want you to type in the chat one word, just one word. And this is a challenge, one word that describes how you identify. And I'm going to take one of them away. You can't do consultant, right? Like I want you to go a little bit deeper than that. Just one word on how you identify. One word, unique. Thank you, Jerome. Beautiful, beautiful. Curious, very nice, very nice, kind. So now you've been primed. You got a little anchoring bias happening here. Human, thank you, Linda. She deviated from that priming mechanism of just a, 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 a personality trait. David, systems thinker. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Listener, thank you, John. Interested, John Tracy, beautiful. Umberto is open. Excellent, excellent, excellent. This is a great activity in many, many ways. It, it, it's forcing you to do a couple things that we just discussed. You're going to the most recent, right, descriptor of who you are. Know that we all have multiple words, multiple dimensions to our identities that transcend the obvious. And each one of these that you're putting in here is it makes up a hue of that lens and how you see the world and how you navigate through the world. And it is such a strength, right? Until in some cases it's not, right? Amidst all of these other, these 11 million bits area of unconscious mental processing, we all in our behaviors at time have biases that we think work for us and they most definitely have. But simultaneously, it can be possible that they may be working against others. And our brains will find very convenient ways to justify that act and keep it focused on uh, the positivity bias of how it helped and benefited me, how it benefited me in that context, right? So what I'm going to do is challenge you today. I'm going to challenge you to go into a breakout room uh, for about 10 minutes. And David has these teed up with three to four people. And I'd like for you to, to, to start with a human connection. If you don't know the people, share something that is not obvious just by looking at you. And then uh, I want you to try to identify, think through and unpack like me bias, right? This is the easiest one, I think, to get our minds wrapped around, to pull out of the unconscious area and into our conscious area and just share how that's presented itself in your work or in your life. Could be a simple conversation, could be whatever that might be, that, that's completely up to you. And then reflect how that bias may have worked well in that time if for you, but, but over time, if that pattern is persistent, how may it serve to work against other folks? 